Hey, welcome back to Gold's Garage. So we're back to the race car engine. Uh, no Pontiacs for a while. Uh, that Todd's is waiting for parts. Uh, the other Pontiacs waiting for parts. So we're going to get back to the race car motor. And so a while ago, I, I initiated a project uh, to build a race car motor for my son who was going to race a Michigan Modified up in Northern Ontario and Northern Michigan. And I asked for input uh, as to, you know, what would you build if you were building one? Because I haven't built a race car motor for a while. So, and, you know, the response was overwhelming. Uh, there's so many people out there that are willing to share their knowledge and experience, some actual experience driving race cars, building race car engines. And uh, I think I got to share with anybody that's watching right now, you can learn, hopefully you can learn from listening to me sometimes. Read the comments because you can learn as much. I learned from the comments and you can too. And uh, speaking of comments, I'm a little behind on responding. I look at them all. I think I got well over 100 comments in the last video that I made. It takes time. I try to provide good answers when I do. I'll get to it, but I do read them all and I'd like to thank you. And, and I uh, had a good suggestion the other day, a video that you line up a bunch of comments, a lot of commonality and comments and, and sort of knock them all off together. So uh, we'll try and do that. So today I want to uh, share with you what we decided to do with the race engine. So this is, uh, someone asked about the rules. So the engine rules are pretty open. Uh, you need one carburetor and eight spark plugs and no dry sump tanks, no dry sump motors. So dry sump means that the oil tank is not connected to the motor, it's in behind the driver. And so those are the only real three rules uh, for a race for the engine. So it's pretty wide open. You can build pretty much uh, everything, anything that you want, you can build easy build as much power as you want. The equalizing factor in the rules are it's a 2,500 pound car on an eight inch tire. And the tire is an equalizer. And you have to remember on a circle track, typical lap times, 14 seconds or so. That's maybe three and a half seconds on each straightaway at seven. And the other seven seconds is in the corner. Power only helps you when your foot's all the way on the throttle. Weight hurts all the time. So you have to remember that when you're doing anything with a race car. Weight is a critical item and where you put the weight is a critical item. But uh, back to the engine. So what I decided to build, this is a, a 406. It's going to be a 406 at 400. I've already had all the machine shop work done. We did pretty, we decked the block. That worked out good. I ended up with I've already mocked it up. The process I'm following right now, my son's coming down in a couple of weeks. We're going to do the final assembly, but I'm mocking everything up, taking all the measurements, got all the crankshaft uh, clearances, piston to cylinder wall clearances, rod bearing clearances, all with the dial board gauge and a micrometer. And I'll emphasize again, you know, you need to check, check, check everything. You just cannot take a chance these days. Uh, I measure every single dimension and uh, especially if it's going to be a race car motor where it's going to see uh, lots of RPM lap after lap, uh, you got to make sure you get things right. And I'll give you some examples later in this video. Got a couple of things I'm going to show you when I get past this stage. A positive displacement pump like an oil pump. How does it work? What's the difference between a positive displacement pump and a centrifugal pump like a water pump? I'm going to explain that for you and exactly how an oil pump works, if you don't know that. How to read bearings, and how important it is to read bearings. If you don't do that, you can get in trouble. And I'm gonna show you that. As you can see, I got some of the frost plugs in Mike's engine, and I have, there's another one that I haven't got in. I'm gonna put a frost plug in and, uh, later in the video. So, uh, so back to the engine. So I already mentioned it's not hard to build too much power or in particular, too much torque because a 2,500 pound car coming out of the corner, probably only going 70 miles an hour 
with 500 foot pounds of torque, if the driver puts his foot to the floor, it's going to go around in circles instead of straight ahead. So it's going to be tricky to drive and we have to keep that in mind. So the other thing I wanted to accomplish was the reason I use the 406. Uh, I don't want to work the engine too hard. I'm actually going to make this engine uh, be able to run on pump gas. And I'm going to use a hydraulic roller camshaft and I'm going to gear it to run about 6,000 RPM and put a valve train in it that's capable of doing that for two or 3,000 laps a year without taking the valve covers off. That's the idea. Maintenance free or very low maintenance. Uh, don't stress the engine too much and get longevity out of it. And uh, another popular way, and guys do it successfully on these little circle tracks, they build smaller motors, 383, 355, 331 sometimes. Uh, and the benefit of that is not having too much torque coming out of the corner. It's easier for the driver to get on the gas. Uh, but then they got to rev them. And if you got a 331 and you want to get around there and make 500 horsepower, uh, you're going to have to go 7,000 RPM every lap so, or more than that. So my thinking is keep the RPM down, run on pump gas. That's a big economy feature. Racing gas is about twice as much as pump gas and harder to find. And that way the engine should be reliable. So what I'm going to also do uh, with Mike's engine, it is a 406, it's going to be a little over 10 to 1 compression. I'm going to use a single plane intake manifold and we'll show all the details as we make pro as we progress uh, in this video. Um, the details of insulation of all the parts. The cam I'm going to use is 550 lift, 240 at 50, around there, get the exact numbers, we'll, we'll detail that. So that cam will be pulling hard at 6,000 RPM. And if we have a hard time getting off the corner, we'll just take gear ratio out. In my experience, uh, which car? This car here was a 427 small block. It had probably 700 horsepower. It wasn't easy to drive. Uh, and we managed that by taking gear ratio out. Now, some guys uh, use restrictor plates. And when we dyno it, we're going to actually dyno it with the restrictor plate and without the restrictor plate so we know where the horsepower and torque is. And we'll probably use different sizes of restrictor plates as well. So we know where the horsepower and torque is. But with that engine, uh, we had a 10 inch tire. So a little better for traction, a little heavier car, but a lot, probably 200 more horsepower. And we manage it by managing gear ratio. So my thinking is this. If you put a restrictor plate on an engine, you limit its top end power, not its bottom end power. If you change gear ratio, it's going to be have less torque coming out of the corner and it's going to be pulling hard 6,000 RPM at the flag and work better for you. That's the thinking that we use with that engine. Uh, he won two championships uh, with that engine, with, with that car, one of them in Michigan, one in Ontario. So. We're going to try. That's my, my philosophy for this build. We're also going to, uh, I'm going to use an adjustable camshaft uh, gear and I'm going to try retarding the camshaft probably four degrees. And that's also going to take, soften the, soften the power in the corners, soften the torque in the corners and uh, make more power at top end. Usually retarding the camshaft takes away low end torque, adds top end horsepower. So that's the thinking with the engine. Uh, stick with us. We've had everything done to this block that you can do. Hatchison machine did a nice job. It's been line board, line hone, decked. As I say, we've got nice uh, 5 thou deck height on it. It's board 30 thousandths. We're using forged pistons. And we're going to talk about all that details as we go forward. And that's it about this detail. Let me know how you, what you think. I know I'm expecting some guys to say, I think someone, someone used, the, used the example. Uh, it's going to be like driving on, a, driving on ice if you got that much torque and that much power on eight inch tire. And I've driven cars like that. So they're not easy to drive. So we got to manage that. We're going to aim for about 500 foot pounds of torque and about 500 horsepower with this engine. And we'll either take it out with gearing or, 
once again, we may experiment with restrictor plates. I want to explain uh, for people, uh, I guess the, the premise would be, what's the difference between a water pump and an oil pump? Yeah, I know, water pumps pump water, oil pumps pump oil. By the way, don't forget to like and subscribe. I always remember and forget to say that. So we're doing pretty good. Uh, we need to keep going. We need subscribers. And if you keep subscribing, I'll keep working on good videos. Anyway, we have an oil pump and a water pump. And how do they work differently? Okay, other than the fact that one pumps water and one pumps oil. So let me put the water pump away. I just happen to have a brand new one. This is uh, Todd, uh, Todd Brown's 389. Just picked this up today for him so we'll talk about that in a minute but let's talk about an oil pump first of all this is an melling melling m55 standard volume standard pressure oil pump every small block chev that come out of gm from 1955 to until the days of ls has had one of these so if there's 100 million small blocks chevs around there's 100 million of these guys around so uh, how do they work? And if you understand how things work, you have a better job of anticipating. Uh, if you just black box everything and bolt it on and don't think about it, and things go wrong, you don't really know how to deal with it. But if you understand how things work, so uh, an oil pump is called a positive, with two big factors, positive displacement pump. And that means when a phallic comes in here and looks, when those gears turn, the oil goes in this side, comes out this side. When those gears turn, positive displacement means oil has got to move. And if oil doesn't move, if you were to, if you were to blank off the, uh, the exit side of that pump, you'd probably break the shaft. Something's got to break because that's why it call, it's called positive displacement. So the other thing is uh, pumps don't pump pressure. People say, I'm going to buy a high pressure pump. Uh, all pumps pump volume. Pressure is created when you restrict that volume. Greatest example, hold your garden hose out. Pressure times volume is a constant. If you put your finger on the end of the hose, the pressure goes up and the volume goes down. Pressure times volume is a constant. Same thing in your car. If you restrict the pressure, uh, restrict the volume, the pressure goes up. So, uh, However, you do have a pressure relief valve and you can change pressures uh, by doing that. And I'm going to show you how that works. So, Felic wants to come in. I got the pump just sitting on the engine right now and I actually marked, uh, that's the inside of the, in, the inlet of the pump. So this is the inlet that goes on like this. That's the inlet. So the pickup tube would be here. I don't have a pickup tube on this pump. So I put some arrows, the oil goes in like that, comes out this hole, goes into here. And as the pump turns, delivers it the outside, goes down. If you look hard, you can see the hole that goes down into the engine from here. It goes into the rear main bearing and goes up and feeds the oil galleys, the, uh, the three galleys that go up and down the block. One is in the center for the, uh, for the camshaft for initially, initially. All block shafts are not priority main, they're priority cam bearings. And the other two galleys, of course, for your valve lifters. So, so the oil comes in here, goes down, and it turns. Now, how do you get uh, pressure is created by the restriction in the system by your main bearing clearances? If you have too much main bearing clearance, you're going to have less restriction. You're going to have lower pressure, and typically you may have higher volume. Now, how do you get higher pressure? So there's your pressure relief valve port. When the oil goes to go back out, some oil can go in the pressure relief valve port and inside of the pump uh, what it does there's your uh, that's your pressure relief valve spring there's a little spring in there so it pushes against that spring and when the pressure is equal to whatever the spring setting is the oil dumps back to the intake side so instead of going delivering out it delivers back to the intake and makes a circle track circle route uh, go back around hope i got that explained that properly so you can create pressure, set the pressure relief valve higher by basically you're restricting the flow, what you're doing. But when the pressure relief valve opens, it just dumps oil back from the output side to the input side. So that's positive displacement, oil pump. 
The clearances next to these gears are very, very small. If the clearance gets worn, or typically on an oil pump, the, the gears will wear the face of the pump, and that'll create a clearance. And if it gets serious enough or excessive enough, that will allow more oil to uh, basically short circuit and not get out the output side, and you lose oil pressure with a worn pump. A lot of oil pumps get changed for nothing. Uh, because unless the wear is severe, uh, there's still more volume uh, available in the pump than you need. And you need, uh, next thing is you need a better pump. Well, these pumps are somewhere around $50, maybe even less than that, I think. You can buy a lot more expensive pumps than that. And what do they do? They pump oil too, just like this one does. So, um, in the old days, what they used to do with small blocks is use big block oil pumps on them to get more volume. And, and that works. And maybe in some applications, it is justified. So I can never make a blank statement. You never need to do that. You may need to do that. But uh, typically for this engine, it's going to be a race engine. It's going to live between four and 6,000 RPM all its life. And I'm going to use a standard Melling M55 pump. And I'm very, very confident Mike will have lots of oil pressure uh, to keep them going. So um, the other thing you have to remember, the way the uh, higher volume pump works, these gears, you can take one of the gears out. I should be able to pull them out. That's, I tried to pull the wrong one out. There you go. These gears are about a third longer. And that's how you get more volume. You make the gear longer, the housing longer, of course, as well. And that pumps more volume, okay? That also takes more horsepower. So pumps take power. They're not free. Nothing in the world's free. And the more oil you pump, if you don't need it, you're using up horsepower that uh, could be going to your back wheels. So that <clears throat> another thing to remember. So what's the difference between that and the centrifugal pump? So I just bought a new pump for Todd Brown's uh, Pontiac GTO. Haven't painted it for him yet as you can see so they are a vein pump so a vein pump works not much different than propeller on a on an airplane instead of make, want to make it go forward it takes the water on the intake side and as it's spinning creates pressure uh, creates throws basically flings the water to the output side let's see which side is the input side <laughs> here, here we go okay that's the input side that's the input side so the pump's turning this way as it's spinning, it delivers the, to the output side, and that's how you get uh, flow circulation of water. Uh, this pump is not a positive displacement pump. If uh, it keeps spinning and the water can't move, it'll just keep spinning because you can see the size of the clearances on the outside of the veins, the, the housing, and that allows uh, water to escape or recirculate inside of it. So that's kind of how that works. Positive displacement pump, uh, centrifugal pump. And that's the difference. And that's why they have to be that way. Something else I wanted to point out, and uh, I ran across building Mike's engine. And if you're a pro, you already know all this stuff, I know. But if you're not, uh, it might be news to you. So the bearings are King Racing Bearings, Cleva, which are basically Clevite 77 Racing Bearings. They are made specially for high RPM applications, and they have. Uh, they also have one thou of extra clearance. They don't always. I ordered it that way. Uh, this is an Eagle crankshaft. Eagle crankshafts I find I use quite a few of them. Typically, dimensionally, are a little bit big, bigger than, and you want to have the racing application between two and a half and three thousand seven inch of bearing clearance. So I ordered the bearings, both the mains and the rods, uh, bearings one thou undersized, which means one thou oversized. Really, the bearing is one thou smaller, it gives you one thou more clearance, essentially. So uh, that part's easy. So here's another factor. So I get the box, and you open the box, and when you open the box, inside, I've already done all the bearing clearances, by the way. I know exactly what I got. I have 0327 and 030 are the range that I'm at for clearance. And I'll put that on an Excel spreadsheet. We'll show that again. So you have two plates, 
each with eight bearings in them. It doesn't say upper and lower or anything. It just two sets of bearings. So you might think they're all the same and you can just start using them, right? So Elliot's going to come in here closer and I'm going to try and show you. So that's the upper side of the connecting rod, of course. That's the lower side of it. And if you look at the bearing number in the bottom, you should check every bearing. First of all, uh, this is a standard bearing because the, the crankshaft hasn't been turned. It's, that means standard size. So uh, the rod size is 2.1. So that's standard is 2.1. The X means it's got one thou of extra clearance. Some of the codes that might be dash one. Okay. And then suddenly there's another little thing there, an L. What does the L stand for? The L stands for lower, which means it goes in the lower half. And if you look at the other one, and where is that? And it's got a U. <clears throat> What's a U stand for? It means upper. So in many, many cases for connecting rod bearings, it doesn't matter. The upper and lower are interchangeable. You can put them wherever you want. Uh, but there's a reason why they do that in this case. Uh, these connecting rods have an extra large chamfer. And the chamfer is because the radius on the crankshaft is bigger than standard. So that chamfer is necessary to allow for that radius so you don't have interference. But you only need it on one side, on the side of the connecting rod that faces the chamfer. Okay? You don't need it on the other side. Because on the other side, the two rods are coming together. So if you look closely, again, I'm going to have Alec come up again with the bearing installed. That moves that uh, ins bearing insert away from the chamfer to give it ex extra clearance. And on this side, it's flush because it, it, has, it can be flush because the two rods are coming together. If you get that interchanged or if you use... Uh, two bearings out of one of these in the same rod, uh, you're not going to accomplish that. You're not going to have that extra chamfer of clearance. So the point is that whenever you are putting installing bearings, look at the numbers. Uh, if you buy a set of bearings, let's say you bought a set of bearings and you turn your crank 10,007 inch, it should have 010 on it to tell you that the crankshaft the bearing is designed for uh, give you the extra uh, Accommodate the crankshaft that's a 10,000 inch smaller. So uh, make sure you understand that nowadays, uh, with the uh, with the availability of you know Google and Bing and all that stuff, uh, there's no reason not to know everything you need to know. And if you don't understand something, look it up. You can just if you Google the code numbers that are on here, the code numbers of the bearings, that information will come up. And you'll know that, but if you're not paying attention and you just interchange these bearings without paying attention to that, uh, you could have a problem. So for all those pros out there that know all that stuff, yeah, it's okay, but some people don't. And, and based on the questions I get, I'm hoping that's going to be helpful. Thanks for watching Gold Scratch.